I would like to welcome Jeremy Dank. Uh, thank you so much for joining us as part of this creative process discussion. And of course, we would love to have you here at Meany Live. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a, a fabulous way to connect. And uh, I will jump right into to our questions because I know that um, everyone is really um, eager to hear, hear your thoughts. Um, you know, I loved the performance that you prepared for us. And for those of you out there who haven't seen it, uh, it's an incredible uh, program that um, includes early Robert Schumann, Clara Schumann, Mitzi Mazzoli, and late Brahms. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, the program, how you developed it. Of course, you speak quite a bit in the concert itself. So just as a teaser uh, for those um, who have not seen the, the performance yet. Well, um, you know, always making a program is a mixture of like inspiration and uh, a little bit of practical matters. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, what can I learn and what am I doing and what do I want to focus on? What music interests me right now? So I had a program all set for uh, London Symphony Orchestra on a Brahms and it was sort of early Brahms uh, intervening with or interspersed with Missy Mazzoli and and other things. and. And then I also had a program about Proust, which I was going to play for you, which had Schumann and, and, and some other pieces about time, about um, reminiscence and nostalgia. And this program has a little bit of a fusion of both of those things uh, to create a sort of a tidy hour long, hourish long package. And it, it tells a story. You know, I, I, I like recitals that tell a narrative or try to create a sense of a happening over the evening rather than sort of a grab bag of various pieces and various styles. And this one is a, is a chronological story more or less from, you know, ardent young Schumann through a somewhat more tormented and, and life tested Clara Schumann to late Brahms, you know, so it goes from more or less 1831 to 1890 something, 1993, I forget. Mm -hmm. And then it veers off to the present for a, for a moment of sort of perspective from our point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's fairly clear that Brahms, Schumann, Clara Schumann is one of the great love stories, tormented love stories mm -hmm. of, of classical music. And the music is full of all this incredible feeling. So the nexus of like the music and the biographical story is kind of irresistible. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sense that they captured, all, all three of them, in a way, captured these kind of longings uh, and losses that we all, that we all have. And, and they managed to use each of them, their own individual musical language to sort of almost, uh, what's the word? You know, like in Jurassic Park, when the, when the DNA of the, <laughs> of the dinosaur is caught in amber, right? It's like somehow yeah. the music actually is that element mm -hmm. of desire and it, and then it releases it back to us mm. in this incredibly powerful and direct way. Mm, that's a beautiful analogy. Uh, it also struck me as really highlighting the importance of musical relationships and uh, you know in the past in contemporary uh, time you know the relationships between musicians and composers and how influential and important profoundly important those are uh, to this day and uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so it's a beautiful program. Uh, I, you are writing a book. So this program is called From Keyboard to Keyboard uh, because during this time of the pandemic, you have, have decided to, uh, to write a book that's gonna be published by Random House. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what stage it's in um, and, and just really a little bit about the book itself, how, how you were inspired by it to, to write it. Um. Well, let's be honest about this. The book has been <laughs> due, it's been due for many years. Yes. So it wasn't like in the pandemic came, I decided, oh, I'll just suddenly write a book. I said, well, if I don't finish this book now, then when will I, when will I ever finish it? And and it seemed also like a like one of the best uses of the time I could I could make. Um, the book, you know, that was also a kind of fortuitous thing was that. For whatever reason, various people at the New Yorker were reading my blog, um, which I did for many years, mm -hmm. and and it was a very personal, satisfying thing for me to write about music in a way that I, in the ways that I wanted to, you know, off the grid kind of, um, not like program notes, not like a, 
a piece for a newspaper. It was just writing in sort of free form about classical music and how it intersected with my life. And they, mm -hmm. they came to me, the New Yorker people, and they were like, well, we think that we could get something together, but we have to talk about what will work for our magazine because your blog, <laughs> your blog obviously will not. Uh, and we had this discussion, a couple lunches, and of course I was beyond thrilled. And, mm -hmm. and, and it came to pass that they wanted me to write about my teachers. And, and that intersected very beautifully with something that I already wanted to do, which mm -hmm. was write a love letter to my, particularly my teacher in Bloomington, George Shebak, and everything that he represented to me, a Hungarian incredible guru of the piano who essentially changed, you know, here I was this little American kid, you know, with some ability at the piano. And I had a lot of American teachers mm -hmm. who went to Juilliard or went to, or studied with people who went, went to Juilliard. And, mm -hmm. and then suddenly here comes this European totally different view of why even we would make music or what mm -hmm. what the purpose of piano playing was and and these incredibly subtle notions of of Mozart's style versus Beethoven's style or you know and and it was so incredibly useful for me to and and emotionally satisfying to write down these lessons mm -hmm. that I remembered and they, they they resounded with me then as I was trying to play at concerts. And so basically the book comes from that pleasure, which I had of just writing about my teachers. And this is a much more expanded story of all these teachers. Because in the New Yorker piece, I sort of, I glide over Oberlin, which is four years of pretty tumultuous <laughs> trying to find a teacher that seemed to understand me or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so I managed to delve now into this huge story of all the different kind of gurus I looked for and found and then had to figure out like what it actually all meant. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that's what mm -hmm. the book is now. It's a, it's a larger memoir of, of lessons interspersed with essays, which I think are kind of music lessons mm -hmm. offered to, to you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think for those um, in our audience who are not uh, musicians themselves and perhaps haven't been in a private lesson with an individual, it would be interesting to hear from your point of view how profoundly not only important those experiences are, but also how universal in a sense. They, they, they range much more broadly than just music, uh, certainly. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> they do. Uh, you know, one of the one of the themes of the book is the way that it is always the teaching is always intersecting with your personal needs and insecurities, and you know, a lot of the things that happen you know, at Oberlin, for example, mm -hmm. were thunderbolts that shouldn't really have been thunderbolts, things mm -hmm. I'd had to discover that, that I was very late mm. in discovering, mm -hmm. partly because I was a very sheltered child. I, I ended up skipping a lot of grades when I was a kid, and then I ended up not having that many quote unquote normal friends mm -hmm. when I was in high school, and classical music is not an incredibly socially successful situation. Um, so when I went to Oberlin, a lot of personal things had to be discovered at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. how do I talk to people without being insufferable? How do I, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, how do I interact with my peers in a way that is not, you know, because I often, when I was a kid, I always wanted to satisfy my teachers first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, my, my classmates were not forgiving or particularly fun to be around a lot of them. And, and so I had this teacher's <laughs> pet, this like incredibly teacher's pet on steroids mentality. Um, and, and I had to learn from that and through that. You know, and I had a, a, a fantastic pianist who was my teacher at Oberlin, Joseph Schwartz. And he, he and I weren't a great match because in a way, I think he expected me to have more information than I did. And he didn't know like the level of like, sort of both piano and emotional incompetence that I, that I actually <laughs> had. You know, there's a scene in the book where I come in to bring the, I bring in the Chopin Verses, which was a piece that I was like, I suddenly heard that Chopin Verses, I thought it was the most beautiful piece ever written. And he's, 
and I was practicing it. It was so fun to play because, you know, the pleasure of the piano and going up and down the keyboard and the elegance of it and the sense of time and calm. And then he, he just said that it was incredibly terrible when I played it for him, which it probably was. <laughs> and, and he didn't want to, he's like, let's leave it. Let's not even try to, <laughs> let's not even try, you know, you, you play other things better. It was like, no, actually, Joe, I, this is a piece that I love and I really need, this is something I really want to know how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a little bit of a clash of like what I wanted to be as a person what I wanted to be as a musician and what my teachers were able and willing to give me, if that makes any sense. Totally, and I think it probably resonates with, with a lot of people um, in, in the more general sense of that, that, that sometimes disconnection between what an individual wants and what either the world wants for them or someone in their life that's a, that's a, 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 a role model uh, wants for I mean, them. They had, all those teachers had very different, um, you know, in a way, I guess, ideals or paradigms, right? Mm -hmm. There was a guy named Greg Fulkerson, who was an, is, it is, was, is an incredible violinist. Um, and he was a very difficult teacher and he was often uh, fairly, <laughs> fairly mean. Mm -hmm. And one of his ideals was that you wanted to play everything that is on the page, you know, like as if you, if you listen to your performance, you would be able to take dictation of everything that the composer wrote, every accent, every forte, every piano, every retard, mm -hmm. you know, just an absolute fidelity, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there was another teacher, another wonderful teacher, Norman Fisher, cellist, and he thought, he had a different paradigm, which was that you, you began to investigate the piece as if you were an actor, mm -hmm. um, as if you had to inhabit a, a role and be that piece, mm -hmm. and in a way reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. like understand its motivations. Mm -hmm. so not only did you have to do what was on the page, which was great, but you, more importantly, you had to know why it was there, mm -hmm. which okay. is a completely different set of, of propositions. Mm -hmm. And that led me to play in all sorts of ways to find things between the notes kind of that um, were human and humane. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you played this work for Missy Mazzoli? The work, sorry, the, the piece that she uh -huh. wrote? Uh, I have not, I, I sent her a video mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And she gave me a few comments, which are very useful. And I still hadn't memorized it at that point, uh, which I haven't yet in the in this mm -hmm. this performance. Which uh, it's a, it's because a, it's a minimalist piece. Uh, it keeps revisiting the same uh, cells of, uh, of ideas. So it's, yeah, it's a bit tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting that sometimes you know a contemporary composer will just say, "Well, what do you think?" <laughs> when you ask a question, as opposed to, you know, this fidelity right. to the score. Um, so yeah, that's no, that's true. There's so much that a composer can't write in the mm -hmm. score, right? Mm -hmm. that, that can't be notated. And I think that's really important to remember. Mm -hmm. um, she told me that it had to be more schizophrenic. So I tried to play it more schizophrenically. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In writing about your teachers, were there teachers that were, that you remember as being so positive and uh, uh, supportive um, as opposed to the critical teacher that um, you know tends to say well, let's just leave this um, that really shifted your thinking about your playing you know um, both Shevok and Starker you know the big two Hungarian gurus that I worked with in Bloomington Hungarians are not known for their nurturing um, qual qualities my, 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 my uh, father's Hungarian I love you, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have many other virtues, but there's kind of, um, so they tended to be more about, uh, Shevok was more supportive, but he also found his way to saying some of the cruelest possible things to me, especially as I write in the, in the New Yorker piece, you know, especially when I thought that I played well, he made a special point of making sure that I didn't, that I didn't feel too good about myself, which is a little bit like, um, it reminds me of that scene in Patton, you know, where the, mm. they talk about the, the Roman conqueror coming back with his laurels and someone's always whispering in his ear that triumph is fleeting. Mm. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he had that, that quality. Mm -hmm. Then every so often, you know, I would do something and I would say, oh, I'm thinking of going to, you know, um, you know, once I, I was like, I want, I want to go to this school to study accompanying. And he's like, no, you're not, 
you're one of the people who has the talent to be a solo artist and you i don't think you this is the right channel for you you know mm. And I think at that moment, <laughs> that was as supportive as he ever got. And I understood, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, but there wow. were, of course, you know, it's a cliche to say voice teachers were often more supportive mm -hmm. <laughs> and nurturing. And they, would, they, they knew how, of course, they're always trying to keep their singers on the rails, right? And keep them confident and mm -hmm. ready to be themselves. So I had a lot of close relationships with voice teachers uh, including this particularly one at Oberlin, and they helped a good deal making me feel. There was a wonderful woman at, in Bloomington also who was once a big star, uh, you know, Virginia Zayani. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that name. I, I um, don't. She was a marvelous character, and, and, and in her day, one of the great Violettas in La Traviata. Mm -hmm. And she heard me play with one of her students, and then she heard me play at something, and she, I was like her cause at that point. She's mm -hmm. like, this is, this is someone... I believe in what he has to say about music. And I was a little twerp still, you know, 21 year old kid. But she did all sorts of stuff for me um, behind the scenes that I, that I only learned about, you know, later. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, one of the really important acts of teaching that we don't really realize or talk about that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I would like to ask you a question about the, your life writing versus practicing and performing and sort of how you see them as similar different how do you get into these different head spaces to do both particularly now um, such an unusual time how you think about the act of creation in in these different ways uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little well, question you know, deadlines are really useful so i'll say that at the beginning which is a very it sounds like a heartless thing to say but you know, I set a deadline for myself to finish this book this summer, right? When things were um, quieted down. And, you know, I approach it like any other thing. I tend to, like for myself, I work better right after coffee for any number of hours. Mm -hmm. I'm very strict about coffee for various reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and so the morning is my great time for mm -hmm. things, for making associations. or, And then very often, you know, you, you work for a couple hours and you reach a bit of an impasse, and then I, I'd go for a walk. I was up in the Catskills. I'd go out and mm. and uh, take an hour and a half walk, and I'd come back. And then there'd be another couple good hours, and then you, I began to feel that my my creative juices were mm -hmm. drying up for the day, mm. and it was time to do tasks or eat mm. or. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the, for me, the creative process of you know like writing. It's very hard for me to imagine how writing about all these music lessons could be interesting to lots of people, but then mm -hmm. I began to I began to find scenes, you know. I was telling you earlier about this lesson I had with my friend Derek, mm -hmm. who I was kind of a little bit maybe in love with, um, and mm -hmm. and his teacher Norman, who I was talking about, and and it was this lesson that we had together, it's, which was the kind of climax of the whole working on this Brahms sonata that we did. Mm -hmm. And this scene, because at the end of the lesson, there's sort of like this incredibly fraught, you know, working through the whole piece and thus complaining about all the things he's getting us to do. And he says, stop complaining and just do it and make it happen. And then he's mm -hmm. like, this piece is thinking about itself. And then we're struggling to find this. And, you know, at the end of it all, we're, we're sweaty and exhausted. And, and I'm still practicing something. And Norman tells me to... to you know, stop practicing, and, and I'm still working, and he comes over, and I can, he, I'm getting up from the piano, and he comes over, and he gives me this enormous hug, you know, mm. and, and this hug, because it was so different from the way that my parents were, and it, it resonated on many levels of, of need and accomplishment, and, and also what the music meant, mm. and once I found that scene, which was like, there's a simple lesson that we had, but it, it changed it definitely changed my life from that moment. You know, what I thought about music and what I thought, you know, chamber music should be like, you mm -hmm. know, and the whole act of finding a piece together. Um, so once I found those scenes, which had meanings well beyond just the music and like what fingers you use and what, <laughs> once the, those scenes kind of like created a nucleus, then you can go out, the rest of the book kind of writes itself around them, mm -hmm. right? 
And that's often the way we work through a piece of music too, mm -hmm. I guess. Once you find some truth in the phrase, then you can arrange the rest of the phrases around it towards mm -hmm. that place. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. And then also, you know, in our earlier discussions, you were talking about how you program, how you program a concert and right. how you start with that, those phrases, pieces, uh, keystones, mm -hmm. and then work out from there. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. We were talking about the uh, You know, the, one of the first programs I really toured around the States was the, the Concord Sonata, which is mm -hmm. a very unlikely thing to, to end up touring. Um, but I, I came up with, you know, it's like, there's something about that piece. It's kind of a monster. It doesn't quite fit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a piece that's unruly. It doesn't fit in one style. It doesn't mm -hmm. fit in one. It's very long, it's mm -hmm. very arduous, and then suddenly it turns um, this incredibly mm -hmm. transcendental thing. It, mm -hmm. it has a message and it has a weird American messy complexity to it. And Absolutely. what other piece could I put with it? You know, what's mm -hmm. the truth of that piece? And, what, and it's like, well, maybe the Hammerklavier Sonata of Beethoven has mm -hmm. a similar something to it. Mm -hmm. And then once you have that truth of the connection between the two pieces, you're like, oh yes, that program mm -hmm. mean, means something. Mm -hmm. and, and that's you know that's how I ended up connecting also the Ligeti etudes and the Goldberg variations is that sort of the the beautiful cosmic math of the Goldberg variations mm -hmm. and then the the sort of post chaos theory fractal math mm -hmm. spinning off into you know into wild whorls of unexpected things and it's like two maths separated by you know hundreds of years mm -hmm. um, talking to each other. Mm -hmm. In, in a very emotional way, weirdly. Mm -hmm. um, and and is I, that <laughs> not at all. And as and if I, I may say, I, I think that that's what makes your programming so brilliant, is the relationships. Of course, the playing is speaks for itself, but the relationships between ideas and forms and structures and periods and um, and and unusual juxtapositions, uh, which is is yeah. just so. Fascinating. Ideally, you know, somehow yeah. find some unexpected in the old uh, in the old chestnuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, so speaking of which, um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about any new programs that you're developing right now. And of course, there's a lot going on in the country and and a lot around Black Lives Matter and how how you're thinking about classical music in relationship to to this um, to our history and 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 the time in which we're living in relationship well, to this <laughs> one of my other goals for the this down enforced downtime was to and i'm doing okay on that goal i could i'm, I'm trying to do better is to learn a lot of new music mm -hmm. um, mm. not only just i want to learn some new old music you know pieces mm -hmm. that i haven't played um um, I, for example, I never played Papillon, which I, is a piece I've always loved mm -hmm. and I think is a kind of beautiful emblem of romanticism. And, mm -hmm. um, and then also I want to play pieces of, by young composers or, or composers of color, of course, that people who I, I have been terrible at neglecting. Um, mm -hmm. So over the summer I hatched this program that, um, that I'm doing now and it, it seems to have... I put together a little suite of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I read this wonderful piece, which I recommend to everyone. Uh, George Lewis wrote in the New York Times about the sort of vanishing black composer. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes through a lot of voices, uh, talks about what they offer and what their, what their music is, is doing. Uh, and I just had a Zoom with him last week and he's such a lovely, lovely, lovely person. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I told him that he had written about this piece by, uh, by uh, what's his name, Blind Tom Wiggins. Mm. And that's a very interesting story. And the piece, his description of the piece stunned me because it's, from, it's a piece, I think, from the 1860s mm -hmm. about a battle that the Confederate Army won. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's a battle piece that depicts it and it has all this tremendous violent stuff clusters huge you know you'll be playing along the battle of the 
cannons come in, and it, it, it's, it sounds like a piece from, you know, 50 years later, right? Mm -hmm. It's well in advance of anything that, that had been written. And, and it also resonated very much with another piece I was working on by Shevsky called the Winsboro Cotton Mill Blues, mm -hmm. in which clusters um, function as the kind of cotton mill. Mm -hmm. And... and there's this quality in that piece of the, the machine-like time of the clusters. At war with the kind of more human and humane blues, which you hear. And, 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 and he does all these incredibly ingenious um, combinations. So. Those two pieces seem to really speak to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I built a, and I, and it was a piece by Tanya Leon that I had always wanted to play, who's a Cuban American composer of, of great note mm -hmm. and whose music does not get played enough, mm -hmm. not nearly enough. An incredibly violent piece called Ritual. And then I had, I thought that was a lot of violence. So I thought there's this, the, the last or one of the late Joplin rags. Um, and I and I put that in there. The one, the you know, maybe. The... Which keeps kind of kind of circling around these yearning chords. And there was something about this little suite that I thought it had some. It felt relevant um, mm -hmm. to the world at this moment, and and so on. That's that's the program I've been. That's the mm. little a bit of a program I've been working on now. I would um, mm, I would so look forward to having you perform that here at Nini. So no, maybe that'll be the next the next performance here. The piano was somewhat smoking afterwards. You felt that there were. <laughs> <laughs> we got two, but, so. But it felt good. I played Beethoven after it, and that also felt good. There's something about the connection of the, you know, the revolutionary aspect of Beethoven, you know, sort of it's like so storming, right? There's some connection there you know, between the protest music and the. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to think about him in that context, uh, of course, around this anniversary of the 250th anniversary of his birth. Um, so I would just like to close with one question. And I, I, I think earlier I said I might not go here, but I think I, I just want to hear, hear your thoughts one more time about this, which is, you know, we talked earlier about the, your vision for the future of classical music and, and this idea of expanding the repertoire without uh, losing the music you love. And, 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 and what do you think is going to be the next three to five years or three years of where musicians can go during this time? to really recognize the need to expand the repertoire. I mean, of course, you're doing it. Um, what, what other aspects do you think we're going to be able to expand into? I, first of all, I wouldn't presume to have a vision. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, and and, and I'm, I, you know, it's a very small part to play pieces that, you know, you know it, I think it is incredibly important to advocate for music that is not heard enough. and and. And curation is one of the things that that we have to do yeah. mindfully and responsibly, right? That's. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us, and I know I've had a lot of drinks out in Central Park this summer mm -hmm. with various young musicians or middle-aged musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, um, all of us asking ourselves the same question, which is, how do we preserve the great things that we love? And yet broaden them to be more inclusive, um, and be and be mindful of of the ways in which our world has has uh, hidden boundaries, mm -hmm. or or not so hidden in some mm -hmm. <laughs> in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't say that I have a great answer to mm -hmm. all of that. But I, again, I think play pieces that you're interested in that are you know look out of your comfort zone obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> you know try to find what is in the voices that you don't understand what what can you understand from those voices even if you're confounded by them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at first mm -hmm. and and thank you and i would i would share that you know as a curator i'm certainly thinking about that in terms of the voices that we bring in to Mini 
and also, you know, hoping that audiences continue to expand uh, and and be open and willing and excited to hear music that's outside of their comfort zone because it, it takes that ecosystem for it all to to be possible. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we all have to we all have to sometimes just stretch our ears a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a very American value, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course, so I hope we got quite a little Yeah, much like. not at all. This is just a fantastic uh, discussion, and as always, it's just it's it's so exciting to talk with you. And I and I look forward to having you here at Meany, uh, where we have this wonderful footage of the concert that you you performed for us uh, that we're sharing with audiences. And then yeah. um, and and again, I look forward to continued discussions and and continued partnership together so thank you and and this book anything you want to say about uh, about the book um, I know we don't have a, a date yet when it will be published but um, just you know so people can be excited for it well it, it got sent in uh, in early September uh, the editor is working his way through it I've never done this uh, before so I don't know how long it takes but I hope it's pretty close we've been through a few rounds of discussion back and forth so I think it's not that far um, it could conceivably um, come out next year, mm -hmm. either spring or fall, from mm -hmm. my point of view, but maybe I'm insane, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. Um, well, I can't wait. I can't wait, mm -hmm. and, and thank you so much. Uh, it's great to talk to you, Jeremy. Likewise. Okay.